Welcome to today's webinar, which will be an update on the transatlantic trade post-COVID-19, what's new and what's next. This event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce New York, where Americans and Europeans connect to do business. My name is Yvonne bendinger Rothschild. I'm the Executive Director of the EACC New York, and I will be your host for today's event. Today's program will address issues such as um, COVID-induced changes, in trade and the digitalization, will it be here to stay? Um, what's happening in supply chain and do the service impacts have been diverted for the long term or is this a short term measure? Um, what trade deals have been made recently and um, which other trade deals might be on the horizon? We're looking at TTIP 2.0 and a possible um, UK US deal and what's happening on Brexit. Um, we will be talking about trends on EU US collaboration with the uh, um, new administration coming in, and of course, with the, of, um, about um, the future of the World Trade Organization, which reforms are necessary to effectively manage trade in the future. Our speakers include Pascal Lamy, he's President Emeritus at the Jacques Delors Institute and the former Director General of the World Trade Organization. Pascal shares his time between the Jacques Delors think tank in Paris, Berlin, and Brussels, as well as the presidency of Brunswick Europe. I'm not sure how he does it, but when he, uh, uh, he also holds positions at various French, European, global boards and advisory boards. Uh, Lucinda Grayton is the CEO of Vulcan Consulting. Lucinda is a former Irish Minister for European Affairs, and she was um, at the Irish Parliament as a Minister for European Affairs during Ireland's presidency of the EU Council in 2013. And in that role, she um, represented the EU in initial trade talks with the US um, on the TTIP negotiation. And um, we also have Andrew Betts. He joined the um, HSBC Commercial Banking in 2014. And he is a managing director of Glo and global head of commodities and global trade and receivable finance receivables finance. Um, prior to HSBC, Andrew held leadership positions at JP Morgan Corporate and Investment Bank. Before that, he was with um, RBS. And interestingly enough, he started his career at Deutsche Post DHL. Our moderator is Andrew um, Moravczyk. He's a professor of um, politics and international affairs at Princeton Universities. He, Andrew, um, um, runs the uh, um, Liechtenstein Institute, where he is a professor of politics and the director of the European program. Um, he has authored hundreds of publications, one of which on Europe brought us together. I reached out to him to congratulate you on the great analysis he did in that, um, in that report. And he also author authored four books on European integration, international law and organization and human rights and he's writing a few more right now. Um, with that, Andrew, I hand over to you. Please um, get us started on our discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yvonne. Uh, and we're very happy at Princeton to be co-sponsoring this event. We have a great panel um, who've been introduced and we'll get right to them. We'll have five minute quick rounds, then we'll pose a little conversation, have a little discussion amongst us and then leave plenty of time to open it up to the audience as a whole. So let's just take it in the order that uh, they were announced. Uh, Pascal, take us away. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Yvonne. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrew. Congratulations on uh, the choice, uh, your choice, uh, this date uh, for the discussion. It's the one that uh, Brussels has chosen to publish. Uh, brand a uh, new principled partnership agenda between uh, EU and US. So we're just fresh from the oven. Uh, and I'll start with a, also a small caveat, uh, which is that uh, we are meant to discuss the EU US trade relationship post COVID, uh, whereas unfortunately, it probably would be a bit presumptuous to uh, pretend that we already are in a uh, post-COVID world, uh, not least uh, because even if the sanitary situation may be more or less in control, and it's probably a bit more in control in EU than the US, uh, there still is a huge lot of social and economic damage in the pipe 
uh, which uh, will uh, be longer uh, than the uh, virus. Now, uh, let me mention three features of uh, a post-COVID world, uh, which is a discussion we've had during six months with many, many colleagues in every continent, but let me limit my three features on those who, in my view, will have a bearing on the US-EU trade relationship. Uh, the post-COVID world will be more digital, it will be more Chinese, and it will be more risk adverse. More digital, uh, I think, uh, I don't need to explain this. It's clear that this uh, virus has, uh, and the physical barrier uh, it has uh, triggered have uh, uh, pushed us uh, five or 10 years forward in terms of digitization. A world which will be more Chinese as uh, China is, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, the big winner of this crisis in both uh, geoeconomics and geopolitical terms. And uh, more risk adverse, uh, because I think that uh, areas like health, like uh, the environment, uh, like the sort of uh, uh, just in case instead of just in time, which is a good way of talking about this big conversation about reshoring, readjusting supply chains, although I don't think there'll be a lot of that. And I may have different views from many of my uh, colleagues on the uh, trade side, uh, yet there will be some sort of impact, uh, the reallocation of some supply chains. So these are the three things I will retain for the sake of brevity. What does this mean for the uh, US-EU uh, trade relationship? Uh, first, bilateral. Second, multilateral. Bilateral, I think this will uh, mean that uh, our trade agenda will have to switch from what I call protectionism to what I call precautionism. Protectionism is when you protect your producers from foreign competition. Precautionism is when you protect your people from risks or whether you protect their rights. This is the case in areas like uh, safety, uh, security, uh, privacy. We've always had a lot of trade measures that have a precautionary purpose, regulation, standards, norm certification, more of that in the future. And this means that the EU-US trade relationship has to go back to where it was partially, painfully, during a bit of time, uh, which is a uh, regulatory dialogue. Most obstacle to trade between the US and EU stem from differences in the way precaution is leveled or administered. And we have a very good example of that in this uh, brand new proposal of the Commission today uh, of a trade and tech council in order to oversee a regulatory dialogue transatlantic on this. Uh, another area which is regulation uh, related uh, is climate change, hence a necessary dialogue on things like how to get to zero carbon, uh, assuming the Biden administration uh, does that, which is the EU assumption, including, by the way, in addressing uh, difficult problems like uh, border carbon adjustments. That's for the bilateral. Uh, let me finish with the multilateral. I think multilaterally, uh, like uh, uh, the Peterson Institute said it uh, in a recent webinar, uh, the task uh, is uh, to make trade boring again. Can Biden make trade boring again? I think this is the perfect agenda, which means uh, US back to the negotiating table uh, in order uh, to fix a number of problems, two of them being one, reform of the, US, of the uh, WTO dispute settlement, uh, where US has basically to be back to the table, whatever shape the stakes. And second, WTO reform, notably, notably uh, uh, disciplining uh, uh, subsidies, uh, leveling the pain field with China, uh, which is uh, something which the Trump administration tried to do unsuccessfully because it took, in my view, the wrong strategy and the wrong tactics. We have to be back to US and EU pushing together for China to accept. Uh, more state aid uh, disciplines. Uh, this is roughly uh, the agenda. We have a few uh, bilateral irritants. We also need to fix Boeing Airbus, a few Section 302 uh, trade restrictions. Uh, to conclude, 
one, how much of that uh, rather ambitious agenda can be delivered? I would raise the expectations too high, as uh, I think a Biden administration will be constrained uh, by a very difficult uh, domestic agenda. Uh, and second, uh, very short term, there's one thing we should work on, which somehow is trade related, uh, which is a COVID vaccine distribution all over the world, not just in the half of the planet, which today is covered by pre-purchases of vaccines. This is something where I think a Biden uh, administration should join Europe on uh, ACTA and COVAX and should join uh, the uh, WTO Trade and Health Initiative. This is very short term, but let's recognize it may also be extremely urgent. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, Lucinda, let's turn to you. Oh, thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you to the Chamber for the invitation to join you once again. And I fear that I'm a little bit like on the last occasion when I shared a, a platform with Pascal, I'm going to end up probably agreeing with him uh, far too much. But anyway, I'll, I'll try and identify some, some points of cont contention, perhaps. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the world is changing um, inevitably because of COVID-19 and um, it has, you know, obvious consequences, which Pascal has outlined um, in terms of the transatlantic relationship and indeed the global trading environment. Um, I suppose coming from um, an EU perspective, I think that there are certain things um, that are interesting that will shape the trade agenda over the coming years um, because of or alongside and in some cases independent of COVID-19 um, and in large part also very much connected to the change of administration in the United States. So while there's a lot happening, it's not all, it's not all um, sort of uh, traced back to or link, link, linked to, to COVID-19. Um, I think one of the, I mean, one of the things that I would observe when I look at both the EU and the United States and rhetoric around uh, trade, I mean, obviously the mood music has dramatically improved in, in even in the last few weeks. Uh, we've seen the EU Trade Commissioner Dombrovsky, you know, talking about resetting the transatlantic trade relationship. Um, the Council of Trade Ministers, likewise, even while simultaneously imposing new tariffs, um, although let, in fairness, they are retaliatory um, uh, and legacy tariffs, but nonetheless imposing new tariffs uh, on, on uh, US imports uh, just after the presidential elections. Um, but certainly the, the, the rhetoric is far more positive than it was. And likewise, obviously, the Biden administration is a transatlanticist administration, far, far, obviously far more so than uh, the predece its pre predecessor administration, but also far more so um, even than the Obama administration. So I think um, we can see in some of the key appointments already, uh, Jake Sullivan, um, uh, the new Secretary of State, and various others in the administration, they are people who, who have a deep affinity with the, not just Europe, but the EU institutions and um, are, you know, positively disposed to building that relationship. So that's the, that's the positive. I think um, when you scratch beneath the surface a little bit, it's not quite so plain sailing. Um, you know, we have seen uh, over the last two years in particular, increased rhetoric um, on the European side of the Atlantic about domestic champions, um, about dramatically revising EU competition laws to enable greater state supports for certain technologies, certain um, parts of industry. And I think that that's something that may um, and perhaps already is dissipated a little bit, but um, it was certainly, I think, um, uh, linked to uh, the deteriorating relationship with the Trump administration. But I don't think that it's just simply going to sort of retreat off the scene. And I think it's something that will um, play a part in uh, in the EU's approach to uh, to transatlantic trade. Likewise, the, the Biden administration, uh, the incoming administration, you know, there, there are a lot of contradictions um, in, in some of what is being said. So on the one hand, um, uh, President-elect Biden has uh, absolutely affirmed his commitment to 
um, to free trade, to to U.S. sort of resuming its position as a, a leading um, um, player in global trade, uh, but at the same time, you know, has set out a very clear and very detailed agenda um, around uh, America first, um, around supporting indigenous, indigenous manufacturing. Uh, and I think that we have to see how this plays out in terms of actual policy, um, in terms of where the balance ultimately is struck uh, within the new administration in the US, uh, and also, I think um, much will will depend on you know what the relationship will be like on Capitol Hill and how much is actually po possible. Um, we have U.S. Uh, Senate runoffs on the fifth of January, which um, will be um, perhaps not fully decisive in terms of um, the legislative agenda and policy agenda uh, of the U.S. administration, but certainly will have a big impact. So I think all of that is important context. Uh, as we sort of delve into discussing some of um, the, the detail of the future of the transatlantic trade relationship. The other thing which um, um, I will reference and we can come back to it is um, the, the green agenda and sustainable investment um, and the Par Paris uh, Climate Accord, which of course the Biden administration is committed to, as, as um, President elect Biden said himself, um, it will happen on day one. It's, it is a top of priority, and I think it's one that we can expect. Um, but how that agenda, especially from an EU perspective, will actually materially influence um, um, substantive trade agreements, I think is going to be really, really interesting. The EU has set out its new tax, taxonomy regulation, all about um, directing sustainable green finance, and it is going to really massively change I think the direction of investment over the coming years in Europe um, and will have an impact on the transatlantic relationship, no doubt. There are also very important issues like digital tax, corporate taxes, offshoring, onshoring, which no doubt we will get to, uh, but perhaps I'll leave it there for now. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we appear to have lost Andrew for the moment, so uh, why don't we go straight to the conversation and we'll fold him back in if he, uh, if he comes back to us. So I wanted to start with uh, China. I think it's fair to say that in the American trade debate for the next 12 months, it's going to be China, China, China. Uh, clearly, Biden has to unwind this enormous um, trade war that's going on, uh, which has had fallout for, for Europe. But the aspiration long term is also, as Pascal mentioned, that the US and Europe get on the same page with regard to pressing China. Uh, and Pascal, you just mentioned um, state aids, but there are a lot of other issues, intellectual property and so on, to be dealt with. So I'm wondering how you think um, the US and the EU should uh, proceed, which issues are ripe and which aren't. I think the challenge will be for them not to make a big problem of the issues where they can't agree and go forward on the ones they can. So what would you advise both sides to do? And I think this will have also for the listeners probably a larger impact on transatlantic trade relations than issues that are specifically directed at transatlantic relations. No, I think uh, what we have in common is that we view China as a uh, possible partner, uh, as a uh, possible, as a true competitor. Uh, and as a uh, rival. Now, how much of these three ingredients in both uh, soups uh, on US and EU, we don't have a lot of time to dwell on that. Uh, the proportions for the moment are different. Although, although there is a recognition that each of these three ingredients shape our relationship with China. Where can we work together in order to maximize our influence on China, uh, in order to have a maximum of partnership, a as fair as possible competition, and to limit the consequences of what China, uh, a threat from China could be, I think is very important. And we need, uh, first and foremost, a dialogue on how can we shape such a common agenda? 
it's of course much larger than trade but it has a trade component and i would say that uh, there are three major topics which have to be dealt with in this eu us china triangle which trump refused to run as a triangle each time macron and merkel and they both told me this each time they tried to say uh, look president uh, we also have serious problems with china why don't we work together the answer every time was bug off i'll do that myself i'm enough of a, of a, of a grand person to arm twist the chinese myself this in my view is not and it has led to the present situation where in reality the trump administration has pushed china towards deglobalizing becoming less dependent from the rest of the world more autarkic and if you believe china is a threat which i think some of us can believe for some reasons making china more autarkic is the least of the things we should do so to answer clearly your question uh, uh, andy one state aid disciplines china has to understand including in using its own domestically grown concept of competitive neutrality quote unquote china has to understand that trade with china will not remain as open as it has been if they don't accept more disciplines on state aids countries on this planet don't want to compete with the chinese treasury second uh, environment a biden administration and i totally agree uh, with lucinda on this uh, once more sorry about that uh, a biden administration will have a greener agenda maybe not as green as the eu one china has just decided a sort of time horizon 2060 to decarbonize us will probably do something of this kind there's a lot of bearing of the impact of a serious decarbonization on trade including including in promoting a low carbon trade and in penalizing high carbon trade which is what the border carbon adjustment uh, which the eu has in mind uh, is about and you may know that we published uh, in the uh, third sister of the institute of a uh, template for an eu border carbon adjustment which is the only one on the market for the moment and which is precisely what the commission is working on which is the role of the thing and finally of course digital i'm among those who are skeptical about the digital world being as globalized as the one we've known for cars and shirts and socks or even or even finance uh, there are good reasons for a more fragmented digital world on data storage localization flows privacy a us eu agenda would be a major thing because at the end of the day the reason why we have a more fragmented agenda is not so much because of competing interests it's about different values in us that data are merchandise in europe it's part of the property of the individual in china it's part of the property of the state who has to access everything this is one thing on which i think there is ample scope for a us eu uh, and this is also very much about trade because let's let's be frank trade will be less and less in terms of value about artifacts more and more about intangibles and what differentiates an artifact from intangible is data content so data is the trade problem of the future and on this i think we have a chance of moving something together provided of course provided of course uh, uh, we uh, we want it politically and it, it's not going to be easy huh? look at this sort of old and i'll finish by this example look at this old irritant about pntr passengers names transmission records for airlines we still have a big gap between the us and eu in terms of what a proper data legislation should be about over to you andrew um lucinda hard act to follow again but do you have any thoughts on this issue <laughs> um yeah i do i mean um i, I think uh 
again, I mean, much will depend on on how tough a position um, Joe Biden adopts when it comes to China from, you know, stri from a strictly U.S. perspective. I mean, you have uh, obviously very significant tariffs which have been uh, imposed under the Trump administration. Um, and I think it, it's really unclear from everything that I have seen and read um, over the past 12 months uh, in terms of what what the incoming president intends to do about that you know um will there be a phase two agreement will it be uh will there be um a, a move to roll back on the the section 301 tariffs um you know is there going to be a, an attempt to sort of um be more conciliatory toward toward china um and i think a lot of that will will very much depend on on domestic dynamics in the united states um, I think it's self-evident that the EU and the United States together um, have far more influence and far more um, uh, potential to to uh, to deal with China if they do so coherently. Maybe not always collectively, but but certainly coherently. And that's where you know renewing a dialogue, which has been absent for the past few years um, across the Atlantic, will be essential. Um, at at, at, at multiple levels um, in the US administration and of course in the EU institutions, but also amongst the key member states. So I think it's gonna be a multi-layered repairing of relationships, uh, rebuilding of trust. Um, and that in part will be coupled with the US re-entering some of the multilateral organizations or re-engaging with multilateral organizations and multilateral agreements. So uh, the obvious one for the purposes um, of this discussion is the WTO, but you also have the WHO, the OECD, where it talks on, uh, on, um, uh, on the, well, I don't want to call it harmonizing because harmonizing tax is not something that we like to hear about where I'm, I'm sitting in Dublin, but, uh, but certainly greater coordination of, uh, of global tax um, strategies. Um, so I, I think, you know, a certain amount but we'll be waiting on this side of the Atlantic to see what what early stage moves are made by by the Biden administration. Certainly the the view here of some of his key appointments um, is extremely positive. People like Tony Blinken are are seen as, you know, not just friends and allies, but but people who really understand, you know, the the the, the cultural dif differences that exist in Europe vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States. We have very much in common, but we also have some some obvious divergences, including when it comes to 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 privacy and digital strategy and so on. We're closer to each other than we are to China, but we still have differences culturally. That's for sure. So um, I think initially it will be a little bit of waiting to see, and then I think it'll be an incremental, slow um, um, building of uh, and rebuilding of those of those relationships, so that the EU and US uh, can work together. And then on all of the issues that we've already mentioned. Uh, environment, green agenda, uh, uh, digital strategy, um, um, you know, obviously 5G being central to that. Uh, I, I think you will see much greater coordination between the EU and the US, which can only be a positive in terms of uh, empowering um, the US and the EU to, to deal with China in a much more strategic way. Thank you. We're still uh, trying to grab Andrew back, who's having trouble in the digital word world we'd all like to regulate. Um, but uh, I want to go to Lucinda. You raised a very interesting issue that was actually next on my list, taxes. So it seems mm -hmm. to me people don't talk about taxes so much in this context. It's always China, digital, um, WTO maybe. But um, this this seems like an issue where both the Biden people and the EU are trying to move forward. It's a fraught issue for many, many people. And I'm wondering what you think the possibilities are for some action on the narrow issue of tax avoidance and chasing down people who are, who are avoiding taxes and on the broader issue of some kind of a code um, about particularly corporate taxation. And it seems, again, a much more essential issue than things that might seem more imminent issues, because after all, in the transatlantic relationship, investment drives trade and taxes often drive investment. 
Well, absolutely. And I mean, you know, the, the European and US economies are so integrated in so many ways that, you know, you can be sure I'm sure that there are many of them um, participating and listening uh, on this webinar, um, you know, interested and concerned to see what happens. So, um, I mean, from a domestic point of view, um, you know, the Biden campaign made some pretty significant uh, commitments in terms of uh, its plans to reverse tax cuts, um, which were introduced by the Trump, Trump administration under the Ta Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So you have a commitment to raise corporate taxes domestically. You have um, a commitment to introduce a 15% uh, minimum tax on booked income of big corporates. Um, and you have obviously significant commitments around tackling uh, offshore companies. There is um, there is a proposal uh, in the in the Biden um, agenda in relation to surcharges on um, on goods coming into the U.S. Um, from uh, U.S. owned foreign subsidiaries. So there's 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 a lot of um, sort of unilateral uh, proposed action there. Um, I think the big question again is how much of this is actually going to be possible for the Biden administration, and how how much of it will the Biden administration actually wish to do unilaterally? So, you know, I think um, like as a former politician, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but I mean, obviously ca campaigns promise big and ultimately when it, when they, you know, when they, they, they end up in, in government or in power, you know, the reality dawns and there's always a certain amount of compromise. And that's going to be, you know, doubly the case in, in this instance because of um, the very, you know, the fact that um, if there is a majority in the Senate for the Democrats, it'll be a very, it'll be a, a, a very, very slender one, or, or indeed, um, it, it, it could still be controlled by, by, um, by the Republican Party. So we have to wait and see. Um, but I think the the key sort of statement on tax, um, and I think it will play probably uh, reasonably well domestically because of sort of the the ultimate objective. Um, but it would certainly play very well um, across the Atlantic as well, would be to re-engage in the OECD processes around, around corporate tax, which is all about, you know, um, shifting profits and, um, you know, closing off tax loopholes and ensuring that um, that large multinationals will ultimately, you know, pay a reasonably fair share of tax wherever they're domiciled. It's very complex, as you well know, and, uh, and very contentious. Um, but I, you know, it's something that um, um, that that you know there there has been, I think, reasonably good engagement um, at OECD OECD level from originally from the US and uh, and from the European Union, amongst others. Uh, and I think if if the Biden administration reengages, you could see some progress there. We already saw the successful implementation of BECS a few years ago. You know. I think a lot of low tax jurisdictions were absolutely terif terrified of the, the BEPS reforms, but actually they turned out to be pretty workable and, 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 and relatively positive. So um, let's wait and see. It's worth noting that the EU published its own tax strategy um, just a few weeks ago. Um, and once again, you know, a very heavy emphasis on closing off tax loopholes, uh, really putting pressure on partners of the EU all over the globe um, to comply, to have, you know, um, transparent tax processes in place. And of course, you know, the new um, EU AML legislation, anti-money laundering legislation on the horizon as well. So this is a really big priority for the European Commission right now. A very big priority, obviously, for some of the larger member states, particularly the French. Um, and uh, I think it's going to happen. So it's a question of, um, you know, the US under the Biden administration engaging um, and, and and starting to shape the agenda because, as I said, um, that sort of that process ground to a halt last September. Thank you. I understand Andrew Betts is back with us now, but we can't see him, but we can hear him. Is that right? I think that's right, Andrew. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, I can. Hey, so how about, how about give us five minutes on uh, your view of these issues? Hey, sorry to drop off the line, everyone. So uh, yeah, thank you for for joining you today. So yeah, just to, uh, to open up really for me, um, I think from the client side, um, you know, what we see is pretty interesting, right? In terms of the impact of, of, of COVID. I mean, definitely the words uh, business contingency, um, agility, resilience. I mean, we, we hear that in every meeting we have with corporate clients in the US and across Europe. Um, the digitalization of trade, absolutely front and center as Pascal uh, has mentioned. 
uh, and and we see a, a huge take up actually. So over 100 percent, you know, increase in downloads of all forms of sort of digital tools, both in the U.S. and across Europe. We see this as a real quantum leap, actually. You know, the a little more more favorable sort of views of e-signatures on a practical level. Um, you know, greater interest in things like e-bills of lading and so on to, to to automate trade. So a real sort of you know impetus coming around digitalization. Commercial line of blockchain type solutions within consortium. Again, clients wanting to embrace future technology, and we see that happening. Uh, uh, you know, substantially. Um, disruption or change, absolutely the feature of the day. Uh, we see shifting inventories around uh, e-com markets. Uh, we see some retailers tripling their their digital uh, fulfillment capability in the US and in uh, in, in Europe. Uh, definitely a build of uh, inventory across supply chains, raw materials through to finished goods. Logistics companies investing. UK report a 40% growth in that market and likely to continue. So, so definitely times of change. And then we have a, uh, in HSBC, have what's called a navigator survey each year. Um, interesting to, to note, um, focus more on innovation uh, and change rather than cost cutting coming through strongly. And seven out of 10 respondents, respondents in the uh, corporate client market uh, are saying they feel optimistic about the future of international trade going into 2021, which again is quite interesting at this point in time. Great, thank you very much. Um, let's go to questions from the audience. So we had one interesting question about an issue we've barely discussed, maybe not at all, which is how the US will deal with the UK um, ostensibly post-Brexit. Um, and obviously the Biden administration probably has mixed feelings about how to play that one. So uh, what do you guys think, Pascal? Well, uh... The dry answer would be not our problem anymore. Full stop. Uh, can we turn to the next question? Uh, well, not whose problem? The, not the US um, or the, not the EU or not the Brits? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a US, it's a US EU problem. Uh, but I mean, I'm, I, was, I was kidding. I mean, my, my heart bleeds. Probably that's been bleeding for four years and probably well, 12, 13, maybe 15 more to come. So I have to, I have to prepare. And, you know, the way to prepare when you have a big uh, sentimental uh, disappointment is uh, cry and laugh. Uh, I think the real issue is like the EU-US issue for the future. The real issue is not protectionism, is not about protecting producers, the real issue is about protecting people, consumers, health, privacy, rights. Now, the real issue is how much does UK want to diverge from the EU standard system, the EU regulatory system, which is, by the way, in theory, what Brexit is about. Brexit is about the UK recovering its sovereignty on regulation, which part of which, a large part of which, it has lost, like any EU country, in uh, creating a, a level internal market. Now, remember, we had borders in Europe, within Europe, for a very long time, until 1992. And they only disappeared when regulatory systems were either aligned or mutually recognized huh? so that what was a, a beer okay for the germans would also be a beer okay for the belgians and the french and the other way around now if the english people want to have their own standards on beer fine this will have a number of consequences on the bilateral trade relationship obviously huh? because what is a healthy good beer necessitates a bit of chemical testing and there will be as much of that as the UK want to diverge from the EU. Now, how much of these diversions with the EU could transform into convergence with others, including the US, is the big question. And if I'm the US, what I will try to do 
in a trade deal with UK is bring UK as much within my regulatory system, like I do it with Canada, like I'm trying to do it with Mexico, like I did it in the Trans-Pacific Partnership with a huge success. The, the regulatory software of the XTPP, which is a bit of a paradox, by the way, which the US constructed, shaped, invented, is now working without the US. And the question now in the Chinese leadership is, should we jump onto the thing? So this is the real question. The real question is, how much will UK use of its new autonomy in regulation? I have no clue of that. And I know for sure that the British government will not be clear on this anytime soon because this will raise huge domestic problems. So how much will they use? And as a consequence, how much will they be able to converge with, uh, with the US? But I think all this is unknown. And as long as there will not be a sort of notion of what UK will trade with the EU, given that it trades between 40-50% uh, of its trade with the EU, I don't think the US will engage a lot without a clearer view of what the baseline is. Lucinda, let me go to you on this, but let me sweeten it by adding another question, which I think you're uniquely poised to answer, which is, how is Dublin, Ireland, I'll read this verbatim because I love the way it's phrased. How is Dublin, Ireland for EU gateway positioned to work with London, UK? Is this x percent reality now or y percent aspiration from the us we can't tell marketing from reality yeah <laughs> well i mean i run a consultancy in dublin and brussels so what do you think i'm gonna say <laughs> <laughs> um no i mean look um i i think uh i mean firstly you know we i personally and i think most sane people in ireland are absolutely devastated about brexit and you know, wish that we could turn back the clocks, but, you know, we can't. And, well, I mean, we're just hoping that um, the, the impasse in London over fisheries, of all things, um, which to a US audience might sound a bit strange, but um, fishing quotas and how many, uh, how many fish can be caught in British waters is one of the most contentious political stumbling blocks right now to a free trade agreement between the EU and the UK. Um, and, uh, you know, our, I was listening uh, to, to our foreign minister a short while ago saying, you know, really we'll know within a few days whether there's going to be a, an agreement between the EU and, uh, and the UK. So it's, it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a surreal position to be in and nobody wants to be here, but we are. And I think it's, it's fair to say that Ireland is, is positioned extremely well um, to be that gateway to, to the European market, to the single market. Um, because of the fact that we already have so many U.S. firms who operate from, from Ireland, not just Dublin, but from other parts of Ireland as well, and who run manufacturing from here, who run their EMEA, European, Middle East and Africa headquarters from here. So we have, you know, Apple uh, famously, um, a little bit controversially um, because of the tax issues, um, although uh, Apple won its uh, appeal to the European um, court's decision a, a few months ago on that. Um, but we have Facebook, we have Google, we have Johnson & Johnson. You know, we have, we have a really wide range of tech, pharma, uh, um, biomedicine and, and other um, industries, US companies that, that sort of lead their operations from Ireland. So um, needless to say, we already have that footprint and it's growing. And we've had some of the largest fin financial institutions in the world, um, including large US banks, relocate some of their operations to Dublin because of Brexit. So that's just reality. Um, and I think Ireland, you know, has played an important and clever game in Brussels in, you know, positioning itself. Um, we have the chairman of the Eurogroup now, Pascal Donoghue, former colleague of mine, um, who's Ireland's finance minister. He chairs that really important decision-making body, which is going to become so much more important now because uh, with the UK gone, the move to, to integration and for, for all EU member states to, to transition to the euro currency, I think is going to be really, really great. Um, 
so you know i think ireland is already well positioned we've done a lot of work i think to build our reputation um, across the EU capitals, within the European institutions, and that work is ongoing. So um, I'm biased, perhaps, but I'm trying to be objective as I coldly and coolly analyze it. Um, and, you know, being the only uh, natively English-speaking member of the European Union now has to be important, has to count for something. And obviously, you know, the UK, of course, prides itself in its special relationship with the United States. but. You know, we believe that every American president is an Irish American deep down. So, uh, certainly a lot of congressmen are. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, Andrew, do your clients have any thoughts about this bundle of issues? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, from from the uh, from the client side, definitely we see we see activity in Dublin, as Lucinda says. So, we see uh, companies adjusting their corporate structures. So where you'd have a corporate structure centered in uh, in London, you know, that is split. Uh, financial institutions have done that and are well prepared, I think, overall. I mean, many open issues still, but, you know, in order to continue to operate 1st of January, you know, those provisions have been made. We definitely see, um, you know, Dublin as, as, as uh, you know, U.S. tech companies into Dublin. Also, you know, suppliers to those major tech names, you know, setting up in Dublin. So I agree, we definitely see that coming through. I think on the broader UK, uh, US trade deal topic, I mean, from a client perspective, you know, there, there will be a degree of support for that for sure. Um, it's gonna take much longer than people think. Uh, I think Brexit related issues, you know, really will sort of stymie progress towards that as we've discussed, unlikely to be a, a priority for the Biden administration in the first one to two years, no doubt. Within that regulatory cooperation, financial services has been a good example of that. You know, it would be it would be great to see some progress on that outside of an FTA. And, and, and this whole topic around anti-data localization commitments as well. So again, the movement of data, you know, is critical. So we would definitely focus on regulatory cooperation and, and the use of data uh, as two key priorities. That's great. I want to go back to China for a second. There's an interesting question here. Um, so, how, you know, we often analyze issues and we think, wouldn't it be great to have a policy where the U.S. and the Europeans get along? And we don't think about how the other guys are going to respond, in this case, China. So the question, the audience question asks, how do the speakers expect China will let the transatlantic trade relations and economics uh, relationships develop, particularly in light of the current EU stance, which seems to look at the recreation of deeper cooperation with the US, but not necessarily with China. Pascal? Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, I hope I will not offend anybody in saying that uh, the core of the Chinese leadership might not have voted Biden. If you look at the long-term uh, strategic uh, and uh, tactics of China, uh, this is uh, perfectly understandable. Uh, I think the Trump period has been a great period for increasing uh, the margin of maneuver, the leeway, and the influence of China in this world. And if I am China, China, I will probably brace for more EU-US coordination, coherence, cooperation on issues uh, that matter uh, for me whether it's security, whether it's uh, including cyber security, by the way, uh, whether uh, it's uh, trade, uh, whether it's uh, influence in uh, Asia or in Africa. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt about this. Now, then this raises the question of what is the balance of forces within the Chinese leadership, sort of Politburo, where is the balance of forces between those who strongly believe China must keep its own way to the future, prosperity, harmony, blah, blah, blah. And that is uh, the way China has to be China first, which 
I think, is the line of Xi Jinping, which Trump has strengthened within the Chinese leadership. And then the other line, let's say, and again, I'm not uh, pretending I know everything, uh, is more the line of uh, Wang Shikshan, his uh, vice president, which we know is not a uh, uh, vice president, uh, an enormous, although the guy has uh, quite a lot of influence uh, in, the, in the party, which is the other line, which is China should cooperate more. China should uh, accept more opening. Uh, China should uh, be more disposed to international conversations uh, within the G20 uh, in uh, various fora in order to, you know, to incarnate what uh, my good friend uh, Bob Zulik uh, uh, appealed at the time uh, to China to become a quote-unquote responsible stakeholder. I don't know which, which of these two attitudes uh, will uh, prevail, although for the moment the Xi Jinping attitude is the one that has prevailed and it is much more like China first. Uh, and when you look at uh, what has been decided uh, at the last uh, 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 gathering of, uh, of uh, political leaders uh, a few weeks ago, uh, this notion that China has to become more autonomous tech-wise, more autonomous production-wise, is something which I think does not go in the same direction, in the right direction. So uh -huh. that's, that's how I see uh, the sort mm -hmm. of the bigger landscape. There are lots of interrogations on this. Uh, while we have, we Europeans to know that if we have mixed feelings vis-a-vis -vis China on this partner, competitor, rival sort of equation, the feelings on the US side are much less mixed. The US political establishment has overall a more either anti-China, and I would say that if I'm Chinese, China caution, and I would say that if I'm American, but I think clearly there is a difference in degree, although this difference has diminished recently for a variety of reasons, recently being three, four years. So we are nearer, although we don't share, I think the same proportion as I already said between these two elements. Uh, if the Chinese leadership uh, uh, understand this, they might be prepared to do a bit of a more move in our direction, notably in, uh, in leveling the playing field in trade. You know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in the Chinese tradition uh, that says that the winner must be a bit more generous than uh -huh. if he's a big winner, he has to be more generous than he's a small winner. I think we, for the moment, China is a big winner. We just have five minutes left. Let me just ask very quickly to Lucinda, 30 seconds. Do you think China has cards to play that could make it really difficult for the EU to respond to any or participate in any joint initiative with the US on this issue? Um, well, I mean, China has been flexing its muscles for some time, and um, of course that impacts on um, EU decision making. And you see, I mean, if you if you just take uh, the 5G issue, for example, the EU almost um, across the board has adopted an entirely um, non non uh, aligned position. So every member state is basically doing its own own thing. Now, the European Commission has attempted to design a framework. Um, within which member states will make decisions around 5G rollout, but in fact, um, you know, it, it's essentially each each member state for themselves. So China is an incredibly divisive issue, actually, within the EU. Um, and so I think, you know, on that basis, there's plenty of leverage there. And I think mm -hmm. the challenge, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like how the EU deals with Russia as well. The challenge is actually to elevate it to heads of state and government level um, and to to really, you know, hammer out common positions and common solutions. And until that happens, it'll be very difficult, I think, for the EU um, and the United States to, to sort of join forces um, when it comes to China. But that's not to say it's impossible. Uh, and I think if anything, we've learned in the last eight or nine months that when the EU's back is against the wall, it can do spectacular things. We've seen it 
you know, with the EU entirely changing uh, the basis upon which it, um, it, it issues um, debt and funds spending programs. Uh, and it happened directly because of the COVID crisis. Um, it's a spectacular change in EU decision making. Uh, and to me, it suggests that that really, you know, this type of change can happen, but the will has to be there or a sufficient level of crisis. <laughs> OK, so we're going to be very disciplined here. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds and you just say, what is it we didn't talk about that people really should be paying attention to? Um, but you don't need to elaborate it. Just get it out there on the table. Let's start with you, Andrew, if you're still there in the hyperspace. <laughs> Yeah, no, sure. I think we touched upon it very briefly, but I, I think that the, the future of uh, sustainability and sustainable finance, the transition risk within the global economy, for me, that's the, one of our biggest agendas going into 2021. Great. Pascal? Two items, short term, vaccine, long term, decal. Mm -hmm. okay. Lucinda? Uh, I think the potential for the EU and the US to become more sustainable and to secure their supply chains and innovate. Um, if you look at the shortage of PPE in US hospitals right now, it's facing crisis point. Um, and this is something that you know was identified in March, April, but it's back and it's a huge issue. And I think that we need to see the EU and the US working together in the same way they need to work together on vaccines. Great, thank you to all of you on behalf of myself and Princeton. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it back to Yvonne. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I completely agree. We definitely need more um, collaboration, especially on those, um, you know, issues like um, when we have a real crisis, like the vaccine, um, et cetera. Um, the, so thank you to uh, um, all of our um, panelists today. Thank you, Andrew, for moderating. Very interesting discussion. And this concludes today's webinar. And a quick reminder, if you uh, um, are a member of the EACC, we will make the list of the attendees available after the event. If you want to connect with any of the other participants, let us know. We will help facilitate that. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.